Um, so our next presenter is John Schuring, who's presenting on successional and keystone native emergence following invasive plant control in Southern Arizona. And John Schuring has an MS from University of Arizona and a PhD from Texas A&M with majors in plant breeding and agro agronomy. He worked as a plant breeder of cereal crops in West Africa with the International Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics. He was also a research manager of plant breeding programs for Europe and plant breeding herbicide development liaison at Signeta headquarters in Basel, Switzerland for 20 years. Since retirement in 2005, John has led the Arizona Native Plant Society's volunteer invasive control and landscape restoration projects on public lands in Southern Arizona. Thank you very much, John. We look forward to hearing about your work in Southern Arizona. Thank, thank you, Lisa, for the introduction. Um, this talk is pretty ambitious. And so I am not gonna go very deep in any one pro project or any lists of species, but I want to touch on some big issues, I hope and hopefully at the end we can have uh, a very fruitful discussion. Invasive plants now infest multiple desert slopes and riparian canyons throughout Southern Arizona. And by Southern Arizona, I'm talking about the Sonoran Desert region of Arizona, which includes the Phoenix area, the Safford area, Tucson area, and Yuma area. <clears throat> We've seen starting, especially after, after the very wet decade of the 1980s, an aggressive uh, change of habit of buffalo grass and fountain grass. And since the 1990s and 2000s, there has been a relentless uh, infestation of especially our bajadas, our desert hillsides, and our riparian canyons. Why are these invasives coming in? What has changed that they're coming in so quickly? And what are they doing? Well, in fact, they are out competing native plants for soil moisture. And it, and it, it just comes back, it comes down to that. And that's the big problem. Our native desert plants have evolved in a bimodal rain season. And they have responded to a wet season in the winter and in the summer monsoons by adapting their growth habits to fit those seasons. They take rest periods between the rainy seasons. And so desert plants, they, 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 there's a bit of a lag when the rainy season in the winter starts in December, January, but the plants really come on with annual growth and perennial growth when the temperatures start to warm up in the middle of January through about the middle of April. And then as the temperatures go up and the rainfalls decrease, the plants slow down and they hunker down. And then again in July, when the rains start again, um, there's a bit of a lag before the plants, the annual plants take off and the perennial plants really bulk up and take up water and grow. Again, there is a, a slowdown and a high, a slowdown of growth and kind of a resting uh, uh, period that starts in November and December and through about the end of January. And that has been the situation, at least through the Pleistocene, since the Pleistocene, when these uh, plants, these desert plants, as we see them today, um, have evolved. And so they evolved with two periods of growth and two periods of, of rest. Um, this is a overstatement, I know, because there are lots of individual species that defy that uh, statement. <clears throat> With invasive plant growth, especially the perennial invasives 
and especially the perennial grass invasives, they could care less about the season. But what they care about is basically moisture and temperature. So they grow fine at the same time in the same two seasons that our native plants grow, but also in these interim seasons when our native plants have slowed down and basically uh, stopped growth, these invasive plants can green up and grow very rapidly and go to seed and they can colonize very rapidly the spaces in between that are left uh, between these, these dormant or resting native plants. And we've seen here in Tucson uh, in 2019, we had a very unusual warm early December, first two weeks of December was, was, was 75 degrees and we had regular rains and the buffalo grass went crazy. And it bulked up and it grew and it filled in and, and it germinated in spaces that were left between native plants. And by the time uh, the next season came and we had a mega drought that, st that, that started, these invasives took advantage of every single little parasitic rain to develop and grow and go to seed. And they did this through the mega drought that we had. And since then, now that we've had the big rains, of 2021 and again of 2022, we've seen buffalo grass and fountain grass bulk up considerably uh, just in the last two years, thanks to the fact that they were able to uh, take off and get a running start uh, during the mega drought uh, when all of the native plants were resting. Um, and again, this year, uh, we had regular rains that were quite unusual through the month of September. We had showers every week and on into October. And here again, the buffalo grass and, and other invasives took advantage of this. And here is, a, here is a, a view of a landscape up on the summit of a mountain where we have been spraying buffalo grass for the last six years. And you can see a wolfberry on the, on the left you can see the brittle bush that has come up, but you see the young green buffalo grass already in early November that is growing and it's hunkering down. Uh, this buffalo grass will be ready to take off as soon as we have, it's raining today in December. And if we get a little bit of warm weather, it'll continue to grow and try to take over all of the progress that we've already made. So these <clears throat> invasives basically are, are out competing our natives because they have no respect for, for, for seasons and they're able to creep in and with climate change and with our more uh, unpredictable climate and rain patterns, um, we're, we're finding that this competition is really quite aggressive. Uh, the Arizona Native Plant Society, through the Conservation uh, Committee, has undertaken three invasive control projects in southern Arizona. One at the Waterman Bajada on BLM land, where there were 18 acres of, uh, of, of monoculture buffalo grass, as well as 10 acres of surrounding infested desert. Um, we took that on starting in 2010. A Mountain, uh, in 2016, we took on uh, the entire uh, summit above the loop road, 23 acres. And since 2021, we've been working with uh, contractors to take on another 45 acres on the South Slope. And in the Catalina Canyons, on the Western side of the Catalina Mountains, this is a sky island outside of Tucson. Uh, we have taken on five riparian canyons uh, since 2016. And basically we've covered six and a half miles altogether of those canyons. This has not been uh, a work 
a piece of work for the faint of heart. It's taken a considerable amount of effort, but the results are fantastic and well worth the effort. <clears throat> what did we do? We basically achieved invasive control and we are continue to achieve it by back-to-back -back repeated waves of herbicide spot spraying. And so we're spraying the bad guys and leaving the good guys. And our objective here is not just to kill weeds. Our objective is to bring back native populations. And on EMOUT, this, this picture above, this was at the Waterman site. On A Mountain, we've taken on the upper slopes and now the, the very steep lower slopes with, uh, with um, uh, volunteers. And we, we don't just spray once a year, but we spray three to four times a year whenever the buffalo grass is green. In the riparian areas of the Catalinas, our major uh, invasive species is fountain grass. But besides fountain grass, there are eight other invasive species that are present. And these invasive grass species come in more aggressively once you take out the fountain grass. And so it's like a Pandora's box. And we had to keep spraying and spraying new species that we hadn't seen before as a problem, but now we've tamed this. Besides the grass species, as well as Sahara mustard, we've also uh, had to deal with African sumac uh, and, uh, and, and tamarisk, and we've taken these out manually. This is an ongoing effort, and it's going to take ongoing permanent stewardship of invasive control. This picture here was taken in September 2022 after 12 years of continuous invasive control at the Waterman site. Uh, we started out with a monoculture of buffalo grass on 18 acres, and now we're down to about 150 plants, but the, the, the plants keep coming, and so we have to keep working. But the results have been palpable. Keep in mind that we did not in any case use any of these three uh, areas where we've been working. We did not use seed mixes. The only planting that we did was by seed, and that was of the woody plants, uh, Foothills, Palo Verde, Ironwood, and White Thorn Acacia on the uh, Waterman site. But you see the difference between 2011 when we started and 2022. On a mountain on the summit where we've been working for six years, uh, these are volunteers working uh, about midway through. Uh, this summer, we, we had an abundance of plants. On the Watermans, uh, we have inventoried 108 native species. And now on a mountain of uh, 64 native species. In the Watermans, 21 of, of those species are grass species. And on a mountain of the 64 species, um, total 16 are grass species. Grass species are essential to desert restoration. And on the lower uh, steep slopes of a mountain. Uh, this picture on the left was taken after a contract spray in October 2021. And then two resprays later, this picture on the right was taken of the same site um, in October 2022. And you can see the dead buffalo grass carcasses, these gray plants. Uh, that are there, uh, they soften the uh, impact of the rain, which basically mitigates against erosion. And they also serve to help provide uh, moisture for our recovering native plants. 
in the riparian areas, our recovery has been amazing because we have uh, such long lasting um, seasons. And so we can spray fountain grass through the winter months from about November until April. But also this ongoing moisture is able to bring up the native plants. And our key native plant recovery has been uh, deer grass, Ulembergia riggins. And we'll, we'll say a few words about that. So native plants have recovered as invasive plant comp competition has gone away. And so I'm going to list a number of, for the dry desert slopes, which was our waterman uh, uh, restoration area, as well as a mountain where we targeted buffalo grass. We had early pioneers. We have exceptional succession species and keystone species. And by succession species, I mean act, those that actively facilitate and accelerate the healing and the restoration of a landscape. These are plants that that actually are 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 are, 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 are uh, catalytic in in increasing plant regrowth and healing. Uh, keystone species are climax species that are essential to the sustained. Uh, uh, recovery of landscape systems. Um, and they are essential to keep and absorb rainwater. They produce biomass or litter as a natural mulching, and they are also nurse plants. So in the dry desert slopes, we'll be looking at early pioneers being brittle bush, annual and perennial grasses, and peridalia exceptional succession species. There are two that uh, prove to be the same across landscapes wherever we're taking out buffalo grass. We see the appearance of desert fluff grass and trailing four o'clock. <clears throat> and the keystone species of those landscapes are triangle leaf first sage and foothills palo verde. The early pioneers as we take out the buffalo grass, one of the first ones that comes in, and it comes in in abundance, is brittle bush and Celia farinosa. And this gives us very good uh, coverage, uh, surface coverage. And here again, this helps mitigate against the effects of soil erosion after you've taken off all of the biomass of the of the uh, brittle of the buffalo grass. Annual and perennial grasses come in very quickly and they spread very quickly. And in particular, the three on grasses, the purpurea and adsensionis. Purpurea is the purple three on and adsensionis is the six weeks three on and it's an, it's an annual. And of course, Budalua aristoides which is needle gramma comes in quite readily. And panicum here to Cali, which is a Mexican panic grass. This little annual grass, um, which is often overlooked, has come in every place we have taken out buffalo grass. One of the problems is, of course, for uh, people who are not out in the field very often, is that young Mexican panic grass before they head out do look like buffalo grass, and particularly people who dig uh, dig only now and then uh, will dig dig out this good guy. Another early pioneer that uh, is often overlooked is a little legume, uh, Peridalia, which is now called Marina perii, and this serves as an under as an early pioneer and it helps with the overall ground coverage but later as the uh, plant communities develop 
This is an often over, un, overlooked undercover species. And here again, this provides shade uh, for the soil and extends moisture after even uh, light rains. The exceptional succession species that we have learned to know and to love are first of all desert fluff grass, Dasiacloa pulchella. This is one of the smallest grasses in the Sonora Desert and certainly the most overlooked and underappreciated grass in the Sonora Desert. This grass is, is two max three inches high. And what happens is that it comes up in uh, towards August, September, October with the monsoon rains. If it's a very wet season, it will produce stolons like Bermuda grass that produce other little plantlets. And then it will live at most for two years and then it gracefully dies. And this is the case of the plant on the right. And this dead litter then is a perfect little uh, it, 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 it plant which catches other seed of other native grass, other native species, and serves as a mulch, a living uh, as a natural mulch for the germination of other species. And this plant, when it comes in on on uh, disturbed soils, looks just like little specks in the desert, but they're actually they're little plantlets, and they show up uh, quite readily right after a rain in uh, August and September. And they just sit there and grow very humbly and then provide, like I said, the skeletons of their, uh, uh, of their litter that, that then, uh, then capture uh, blowing seed of other desert plants uh, that take, plant, take, take root and take off. <clears throat> Our other keystone species in uh, the uh, desert Bajada areas is Ambrosia deltoida, triangle leaf burst age. And just to the west of us, where it's drier in Western Arizona, uh, there is a sister species, white burst age, Ambrosia, um, uh, let me think of it, Dumosa, uh, which serves the same purpose. Triangle leaf burst age, is long lived. It lives for 70 to 80 years, and it's a perennial Sonora Desert Climax subbrush. It is drought deciduous, and it drops its leaves whenever there's a seasonal drought or if there is a long period drought. And if the drought is very severe, it drops its stems. And after dropping leaves and stems over the decades, it builds up a mulch underneath the, the, the plant itself. And this mulch basically makes the, the, the soil soft under the plants and around the plants. And that soft soil attracts rodents and rodent digging. And this in turn accelerates and, and enhances rainwater absorption into the soil. Where you find healthy Sonoran desert landscapes with a good population of triangle leaf burst age, you will not find soil erosion because these are little uh, funnels, basically living funnels to, to absorb water into the soil. The triangle leaf burst age is also the major nurse plant for mammalaria species. The extensive fibrous root system can reach down to three feet. On the Waterman site, after 12 years, we're seeing plant succession in full, uh, in full play because triangle leaf burst age 
is out competing and replacing Brittle Bush. Brittle Bush came in as an initial uh, pioneer plant onto the uh, landscape, but now 12 years later, the triangle leaf burr sage grows next to it, and over a three year period, it outcompetes the taproot system of the brittle bush, and the brittle bush fades away. We now have fixed point photography uh, set up at the Waterman site so that we can trace the the visual differences of this succession going on. <clears throat> the other keystone uh, species, which again is often overlooked in the uh, Sonora Desert uh, upland areas, is Foothills Palaverde, Parkinsonia microphylla. Foothills Palaverde is the saguaro's silent partner. As I discussed last year in the Arizona Botany meeting, uh, the, the entire paper was focused on Foothills Palo Verde. Uh, the public across the world recognizes the saguaro cactus, but hardly anybody except us that live here um, recognize that the silent partner of saguaro is Foothills Palo Verde. You do not find saguaros without Foothills Palo Verde in close proximity. This is a picture of A Mountain in 1926. When you zoom in on this picture, it's basically a forest of Foothill Palo Verde. And then you see the little uh, saguaro sticking up here and there. Foothill Palo, Palo Verde, Foothills Palo Verdes have shallow fibrous roots that grow down at most about three feet and they take up moisture from even light rains. They are a, a legume that fixes nitrogen in the soil. They strongly are strongly drought deciduous and drop abundant litter, which decays and provides mulch into the soil and increases and enhances rainwater permeability. The shade under the Palo Verdes drop soil temperatures 10 to 25 degrees compared to open bare soil around, thereby reducing surface evaporation and increasing moisture availability to young nurse plants. <clears throat> the litter protects young plants from animal soil disturbance and especially birds that dig up young saguaros and other succulents. In the riparian canyons, our early pioneers are way too many to list here. And I'm simply mentioning four that are exceptional because they come in in such abundance. The yellow monkey flower, Erythranthe guttata, cane beard grass, Botryocloa barbinotis, white sagebrush, Artemisia lodoviciana, and seep willow. Baccarus alis sifolium. The exceptional succession species and keystone species are deer grass and rush species. And we'll be looking at both of those in a minute. Monkey flower is the first native to really respond, and it responds very quickly to the suppression of invasives in riparian areas. Typically, we are spraying the invasives uh, towards the end of January, February, March, and by April already in areas where we have basically uh, taken away the competition for moisture, we get a very quick response of growth of yellow monkey flower. Another plant that just takes off and responds very quickly and it responds abundantly is white sagebrush, Artemisia ludoviciana, and seep willow, uh, which are found quite commonly in our riparian areas, and deer grass. 
deer grass is the the I think key keystone species of our riparian areas in southern Arizona. What's amazing about deer grass, and we uh, picked up on it because in 2021 and 2022, we had amazing rains with that flooded the riparian areas for up to a month at a time. And so the deer grass that had come up was flattened by the flood. They weren't uprooted, but the plants were flattened. And after the water receded, lo and behold, we found that these flattened plants, the flattened deer grass stems and roots, serve as a growth media for other native plants. And we found up to 14 species growing on a single uh, flattened deer grass plant. And similar invasive plants, flattened uh, aragrostis species and uh, a, um, a, um, fountain grass, we didn't find any native species growing on the flattened plants. And so in the riparian canyons, our other keystone species are rush species, where we have juncus. Uh, the juncus species that we see most commonly are uh, Bufonius and uh, interior, and Eleocara species, Eleocaris montevidensis, is very, very common. And these rush species bind together underground they, they bind their underground parts to stabilize stream bed, beds and can weave together uh, dams with their roots to retain water late into the season. Um, I can say that we have had a response of tree frogs that has been phenomenal over the last two years. I think a lot of it has to do with the recovery of native plants but this is confounded with our two very wet seasons as well. So in conclusion, we can say that invasive plants are rapidly deteriorating our precious desert habitats by outcompeting and replacing native plants. Selective removal of invasive plants can bring back native plant communities. And of course, this is done only by a long-term commitment of a decade or more. And it's hard work, but it's worth it. Ongoing invasive control and stewardship will be required to preserve selected important native plant areas. And I, I, I mentioned important native plant areas because the Audubon Society in Arizona has important bird areas where they have designated areas basically that are critical uh, habitats for certain bird species. I haven't seen too much effort to uh, enhance or maintain those habitats, but in the case of Native Plant Society, we, we have basically been working actively on maintaining uh, and protecting habitats, at least the three examples that I showed. And I'm proposing that in the future, uh, we think about areas that are very important and critical with critical uh, plant species, native species that need protection and need the word work for ongoing invasive control in those areas. And we can designate those as important native plant areas. So our, now it's time for questions, comments, or ideas. Yes, John, and I think we do have all three perhaps um, in the Q&A section already. So we'll move on to that. Um, first question, um, do volunteers for spraying need to have an applicator's certification or license to assist with spray program? No, 
um, there is an, a, a very poorly understood loophole in the Department of Agriculture statutes, which allows volunteers to spray under the supervision of another certified volunteer. And I am, and there are a couple other people, volunteers that are certified uh, applicators with the state of Arizona. And so other volunteers can work with us. Okay, uh, next question. What type of herbicide is used and how is residual damage prevented? Okay, we, we use the only herbicide that works. And I have a long profession of working with herbicides and I can tell you that this is the safest herbicide that we can be using for the environment and for our own safety. And that is the much maligned um, glyphosate Roundup. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to get into the whole debate here. I can provide literature on it, but basically this is uh, false news. It's fake news. <laughs> that has been unfortunately uh, 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 brought against glyphosate. Uh, this is a very safe chemical. Um, there is no residual in the soil, whatever. Uh, and it is very safe on, uh, on, 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 on uh, animals, wild animals and fish. In riparian areas, we do use a formulation uh, an aquatic formulation of glyphosate that is safe for aquatic uh, insects and um, aquatic insects as well as amphibians. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that information. Um, next question, do we know what the viability is for the seeds of the invasive grasses? And then, not that you specifically mentioned this, but also of skink nut, which is another invasive. You're, you're, did I hear that right, the viability of the seeds? Yes, the viability of the seeds of the invasive grasses, and then also if you can comment, also the viability of stink gnat seeds, which is another invasive plant. Yeah, um, the viability um, of some some invasives is only about a year or two, uh, like Sahara mustard. The viability of many of our invasive grasses, like uh, fountain grass and and buffalo grass, is five, six years. Um, but the problem is we're not just looking at viability of one seed, but when we are looking to control invasives in an area, there's also there's always what we call the escaped convicts, uh, plants that hide under a brittle bush plant or plants that hide under a, 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 a white thorn acacia plant. And those go to seed. And so, yes, viability is important and we need to keep after it. But just because you kept after it for five years to outlive live the original soil seed, seed bed in the soil, um, that's not the end of your work. Okay. We have a couple more questions, just a, a minute or two more of time in this session. What is the status of using biocontrols uh, such as spittle bug to diminish buffalo grass? Um, it's, 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 the status is it's a good idea in the literature, uh, but in the, in the real world, it's, it's, it's not going to work. So many of these biocontrols, uh, like fungi uh, that are sprayed or uh, spittle bug, bug depend entirely on a certain type of rainfall in a certain type of year. Just they are way too environmentally dependent. Okay, and is there anything worth mentioning regarding creosote, creosote bush recruitment? Um, creosote, boy. <laughs> Creosote, uh, in, the, in the big stands, the creosote flats that we see are not native and they're not natural and they're not healthy. Those are an artifact of severe overgrazing from past years. The bovines 
basically have been grazing out all of the other plants that they can eat, but they don't eat the creosote and they leave behind creosote plants and maybe some cremaria, which is a uh, the ratony plants, which are hemiparasites. So if you go out to the creosote areas, um, that's basically what you have. And you're looking at a very unhealthy habitat. That is not healthy Sonoran desert habitat. Um, and so we do not look to increase um, the uh, emergence of creosote. And in fact, in some of our areas, we're actually spraying creosote out in order to get a better balance of the plants that are, that are in the habitat. Uh, 